I remember when uh, the president of General Mills asked me, so you basically made the names of these segments up. Is that right? And unfortunately, that was right. <laughs> Didn't really help our credibility. So um, thank you so much, Susan. Really appreciate you being here. Now you're all in for a real treat. We have three speakers from the Art Institute, Mia, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. I'd um, love to introduce the three of them. It's just such an honor to have them here uh, for myself. They're, this is my other posse. Um, they're just doing great things in the Twin Cities and well beyond, which you'll hear. Um, Kaywin Feldman is, uh, is a PhD and also is the Duncan and Niven McMillan Director and President of, the, of MIA, the Minneapolis Art Institute of Art, since 2008. Um, I don't know how many of you all know, it's 473,000 square feet, 89,000 objets, and uh, 250 people uh, with a $31 million budget. It's a really fabulous organization. Um, they've made some bold marketing decisions like no admission. Um, they've had, uh, Kristen is actually the person who has inspired uh, Third Thursday Evenings, where they have upwards of 2,000 uh, people joining. Um, Douglas Hegley, who's the Chief Technology Officer, uh, is uh, responsible for actually making all of the assets of the Art Institute relevant and connected to uh, not just the Twin Cities, but around the world. Um, so Kaywin is here, uh, and as well, she's been very, very involved in, uh, in her industry associations. She's currently the board chair of the American Alliance of Museums, a trustee of the National Arts Strategies, and the Chipstone Foundation, and a past president of the Association of Art Museum Directors. Um, she's a game changer. She's uh, a visionary. Um, she's turning the art world upside down. Um, she hired, they're kind of in order, uh, Douglas Hegley, uh, who joined in 2011. He had spent 14 years at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art um, also, and I love their backgrounds because it's since started in higher education and pediatrics of all things, and he has his degree in psychology, which I know comes in handy when you're trying to help people translate over into new technology solutions. Also connected in with the Minnesota Association of Museums, the Museum Computer Network, like who knew about all these industry associations? Um, and. Uh, the Journal of Digital Media Management, New Media Consortium. So uh, he's very much out and about. And Kristen Prestigard uh, in 2012 took over uh, the new role as a Chief Engagement Officer at MIA at the Art Institute. Um, so she plays a lead role in the, um, in the strategic communications plan um, and as well had the daunting task this past year of celebrating the 100th birthday of the Art Institute all year long. Um, so please join me in welcoming this great group of people. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, you all realize how lucky Mia is to have um, Gail Fugit as a trustee of the institution. In case any of you are... Other one? Oh. This one? Thank you. So in case any of you are surprised to see the museum at a, a conference like this, um, you're not alone. A few years ago, I was speaking with the um, arts reporter here um, about some of our new initiatives. And she said, gosh, it almost sounds like you think your audience members are made up of consumers. And I said, yeah, they are. And I, I realized that people often think that when um, our visitors cross through our threshold, that they suddenly enter a Leave it to Beaver, Beaver episode, that they've suddenly gone back in time, um, and that they're not contemporary consumers, who, and we have all of the same opportunities and challenges that all of you have, maybe not as many as pharma, uh, but in um, bringing people in. So I'm gonna kick off today to talk a bit about the museum and some of the recent work that we've been doing to attract um, audiences at MIA. And um, you know, we really are a museum that is about business to the consumer. What we're selling is experiences and memories. Most people who go to museums actually go with somebody else. It's a social experience. And so um, we're selling these memories for people of the uh, time they had at the museum. And then when we survey people and ask them why, why they came to the museum or why they like the museum, the number one thing they always say is uh, for enjoyment. Um, which is a hard thing to unpack. We're always trying to figure out, uh, but, but it's because it's actually an experience. It's the uh, totality of it. 
And we do have competition. Most people assume that our competition is other museums, and it's actually not at all. If somebody is uh, at all likely to go to a museum, they're likely to go to another museum. And so our competition is for your leisure time. We all live such crazy lives right now uh, that uh, you know, we have to convince you that those precious hours you have on a Thursday or Friday evening or on a Saturday, um, that they will be well used by coming to the museum. And so that's our competition, is all the other things that you could be doing with your precious uh, leisure time. So how do we then um, appeal to people and convince them that we are a, a useful use of their time? Well, for us, everything starts with our mission and our vision. So unlike a for-profit company, we don't exist to return shareholder value. We exist solely to serve our mission. That's what we do. The $32 million of our budget each year goes towards serving the mission, towards, um, as you see on the screen, to enriching the community. And that's however people want to come and experience the institution, whether it's to see an exhibition, to enjoy the collection, um, because their um, friend is visiting, lots of different motivations um, that uh, Kristen will talk about. But ultimately, we believe that by being at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, people can have their lives transformed, that they can experience wonder, this magical moment as they reconnect to the rest of humanity and um, re remember what it is to be human, because art is an expression of what it is to be human. We did a strategic plan in, that we started writing in 2011, and that's this, the, the work of this plan is what um, the three of us are gonna spend um, our time this morning talking with you about, because in 2011, we were um, just realizing that we had done a major capital campaign. We raised $104 million. We built a new building. We grew the collection. We produced a new logo. And despite all of those efforts, we didn't move the dial at all in our attendance or any of the other primary things that we measure at the museum. And so um, we knew we were working hard. We had dedicated people. Um, we were just really scratching our heads to say, what does it take to move the dial? So despite these heroic efforts, how are we going to um, increase uh, the numbers of participation um, here at the museum? Because that's what we exist for, is to impact uh, people. And um, we really started with our value proposition. So we believe we can offer a really fresh take on a classic art museum where we have the, these great world treasures that people can come and experience um, together. And so everything we've done and that we're going to present hinges on this value proposition. Our strategic plan that we launched had three primary areas, um, audience engagement, globalization, and what we called Museum Inc., sort of rethinking the museum business model. And uh, we worked hard in all those three areas, uh, supported by strategies like experimentation, financial sustainability, and uh, being an omni-channel kind of institution in all of our messaging. And um, we're just now wrapping up that, that strategic plan. And so we actually totaled up and to see how well we did um, setting out to meet some of our goals. And it's, I, I'll actually admit, I think it's quite astonishing. So our attendance has increased by 70% in just four years. And um, as you can see with those um, uh, bars in the graph, it's been a very steady increase. Uh, one of the things you can sometimes see with museums is they do a Lady Diana dress exhibition and the attendance goes way up and then it goes way back down afterwards, whereas we've just been incrementally growing and growing every year. Our membership has increased by 73% in the four-year period of this plan. Uh, our website, 40% increase uh, in uh, sessions on the website. Um, our endowment for operations has increased by 30%. And keep in mind that we're also covering the period of the recession in with this plan, um, so very pleased with that success as well. Our collection has increased by 8%. And uh, we didn't actually start off counting our net promoter score uh, so that I don't have a benchmark for that, but at the moment, um, it's over 80%. And so, um, so what we want to tell you about is how we did that in just four years. And the last point I wanted to make before I turn over to the people who did it um, was to mention that um, everything came down to our talent strategy. We really. Um, had to work hard to build our team, to define um, our uh, culture, uh, to recruit for our culture, um, focused on diversity and inclusion, of course, um, really investing in learning and training across the institution, and our focus on um, retention. I think that's the 
this one. And uh, the com continual feedback loop. So um, I can't emphasize enough that it's really our team that created um, these results. And now I'm going to turn over to Douglas Hegley, uh, right, uh, who is going to tell us a bit more about how we did it. Unrehearsed. Kaywin was on an airplane this morning, so Chris and I made these slides without her there. You heard earlier that I have a background in psychology, um, so it's about people, right? Ultimately, for us, it's audience. It's just a customer. It's just a person. Um, at the core of that DNA and at the core of the museum's mission is about really respecting people wherever they are. So our efforts to drive recognizing people for what they're seeking and provide them with engaging experience is sort of driving us through to this rather than building another building and buying some more paintings, right? If you build it, they will come. Not, not really. All of you are familiar with a lot of these changes, right? We've already talked, other speakers have talked about changes in demographics. Um, these behaviors are interesting, right? Loyalty is very different now. Uh, we use this term promiscuous, which bothers me slightly, but the idea that people keep trying different things on the menu, they don't just sort of always go back to the gluten-free Cheerios every day, right? And that audiences, our customers, expect to participate in some way now, that's a big difference for an art museum. What does that mean for us? Uh, what does it mean for all of our industries? And sort of stronger expectations. Specifically in the cultural heritage sector, research has shown that people actually care more about who they're with and what they learn. So the enjoyment in an art museum for decades, we thought, was on how much information can we paste to the walls. Right? And actually what people are sort of like, I'm not necessarily here to learn, although I like to learn. When we investigate enjoyment and unpack it, it's both fun and information somehow together. That's what differentiates us as a consumer experience. But people now are very interested in the social aspect. Um, people define culture very differently. It used to be it was just opera and art museums. Now it's Downton Abbey. It's going to a park. It's street art and graffiti is all defined as culture. That presents a real challenge for us. And people are stressed. One thing that we find fascinating is it's those darn millennials that none of us can understand who are actually the most stressed. Now, I have a millennial age son, and I'm like, are you kidding me? But on the other hand, this is not, we don't get to decide what stress is, right? We don't get to decide what other people's stress is. They decide if they're stressed. And what we hear from millennials is that they feel stressed, they feel unable to unplug, and they're using cultural experiences to reduce their stress. And that's pretty terrific. Now, given all of these constraints, we just hand it all over to Kristen and we say, fix it. <laughs> little bit about audiences. We're really good at knowing museum audiences. We believe in um, a theorist named John Falk, and John Falk looks at motivations for visiting and less of demographics. So motivations would be why I'm visiting, not who I am, where, where I come from. So coupled with, with this research that we're really impressed with, we're so fortunate to have a, have a group like General Mills in our backyard. And so um, Gail helped us get a grant from General Mills called a Good Works Grant. So we worked with a consumer insights team to look at our research coupled with their expertise to say what, who is coming to the museum and how can we grow those audiences. So the groups that um, Falk identifies are the explorer. So these are people who just like to come to the museum and wander around. Um, you might call them our brand champions. And we're doing really well with them. There's another group um, facilitating parents. So these people want to come and make sure that their kids have a good experience. We already have lots of family programming targeted for them. So again, doing well with them. There's a group called Recharger that, I, I'll be just transparent, we didn't really know what to do with. So Rechargers are people who want to come and just have a quiet experience. And so we thought if we started targeting them with advertising or communications, that wouldn't kind of be what they want. So looking at audience segments that coupled with Twin Cities populations where the most growth was likely were two segments. A facilitating socializer, so somebody who wants to come to what Gail referenced as the third Thursday. So I'd bring, bring you to the third Thursday. We'd have a tour, maybe a beer, listen to a band. Um, or an experience seeker, somebody who wants to come see the one of a kind, the Picassos, the Monets, the Matisse. And the beauty is, is that a lot of the people coming for those experiences are very similar. And so the real sweet spot is that if those are our gateway experiences for new visitors, you can move into the other um, motivations quite easily depending who you're with or what you're looking for that day. So this was all really, really good fundamental research, especially as we moved into 
our birthday year. So 2015 was the 100th anniversary of the Minneapolis Institute of Art. We're all really proud of the museum. We're proud Minnesotans. We're proud Minneapolisans. I don't know. Twin Cityans. It's Twin Cityans. And I live in St. Paul. Um, <laughs> And so we knew that, that this was a big year, a big moment in the history of the museum, and that it wasn't about us. It wasn't about the people who worked there. It wasn't about our high-end donors. Um, we weren't going to just have one big gala. We did have a big gala. It was fabulous. But that was just one thing that we did. So we did a lot of different events all year long, really starting with audiences and the community. Um, we had amazing exhibitions that were um, part we partnered with some of the great museums in Europe and organized internally. We built the legacy of the future of the collection um, with a long-term loan from Myron Cunyon and a gift from Mary Griggs Burke, um, really elevating the bar of the collection of the museum. So it started with great art, great credibility. This credibility really gave us the, the opportunity to then what I like to call play around the edges. So we decided, like we said, that we weren't going to celebrate once. We were going to celebrate every week. So every week, we had a surprise, 52 surprises. Some were big, some were small, some were internal, some were external, um, some were tweaks on what we normally do, and some things were completely different. And I'm just going to show you them because they're fun. I just think they're fun. So this is the Gay Man's Chorus singing Happy Birthday, Mia, and cakes decorated to reflect works in the collection. This is a 60-foot um, ice dragon that we commissioned um, near Lake Calhoun, um, thinking, what can you do in Minnesota that you couldn't do anywhere else? This is an example of something that we tweaked. Um, we, we are fortunate enough to have great masterpieces on loan to the museum often. Um, but what we did with these three is we didn't announce what they were until the day they arrived, including telling the media. And so the media actually went nuts. They, they couldn't believe we wouldn't tell them. Um, and so we'd run a full page ad, and they'd all be out there um, with their cameras the day that they, that they, that they um, showed up at the museum. These are reproductions from the collection. They're very, very high-end reproductions. And what we did is we put them in surprising spots. So um, there was a, a, the Rembrandt hanging near Bobby and Steve's um, gas station, for example. So only one person called to report that the art was missing, <laughs> <laughs> which is a measure of success. <laughs> we wrapped three water towers. So these are details of the collection, wrapped in water towers. Um, we also wanted to make sure and work with artists. So these are two examples of working with um, artists in Minnesota. Um, this is a disco ball that would go off when you'd go into the museum. So the lights would shut and a disco ball would go off for three seconds. Um, and we hired a crop artist. Anyone ever hired a crop artist before? No, me neither. <laughs> um, so this is Stan Hurd. We hired him to create the Van Gogh of the collection in an acre of, um, of plants and um, and foliage um, near Thomson Reuters that you could actually see as you landed um, into Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport. And it ended up on Jeopardy as a question, which again is a metric of success. <laughs> <laughs> and then we worked with other great partners. These are um, an example of a partnership with Handsome Cycles um, that they created bikes that were um, reflective of the collection. So we decided that we didn't decide. We had a great year. Um, but there was one thing that we just felt like we weren't quite um, walking up to. So we wanted to really walk up to the fact that our current branding didn't reflect the museum's emphasis on audience engagement. Kaywin mentioned before that um, three years ago, four years ago, Herculean efforts to bring people into the museum. But we weren't quite getting credit for that work. Um, so we actually have a good brand, had a great brand. We weren't just expressing it fully. And so we hired Pentagram out of New York to come in, looking at our strategic plan, our culture plan, our mission. And stakeholder interviews, they said everyone said the same thing. They said that we were about the audience, that we were about classic with a twist. We just weren't saying that. Our name was also long and confusing. You can hear it here. We all call it different things. Um, so we just tried to clean it up a little bit and drop the S. Um, we weren't getting credit for the work that we were doing, so this is a full-page ad in the New York Times. Um, so for a museum, our, you know, we want to be really good stewards of our resources. Not really sure where that's from. Little logo down there. Um, the other branding was muted, um, disjointed, and, and hesitant. This is the logo that came when referenced. Um, that we, in 2006, got a logo. We didn't have, get a brand. Um, you can see it didn't work small. It didn't work big. It took up a lot of space. Um, so Pentagram came in and said, you already have a great name. You're just saying it wrong. MIA, Mia. MIA means missing in action, a famous British rapper, Miami International Airport. <laughs> Mia means mine, my own, beloved, dear, darling. Um, MIA is an acronym that holds undesirable associations and focuses ex explanation and conversations. Mia is a human name in cultures all over the world with positive meanings and origins. 
that change is a bold way to authentically embrace the DNA, the strategic plan that Kaywin mentioned, and signal to the public a fundamental institutional shift as we continue our race, embrace our role as the People's Museum. The goal is that everyone who visits the museum, whether for the first time or the hundredth time, will truly feel that Mia is mine. So what does it look like? These are the, the um, disjointed rack cards that I looked before. Um, so this is the, what, what a new series looks like. You can see that they're clean, they're confident, they're fun, they're accessible. The ad from before, a full page ad in the New York Times, you're not sure, if you're, especially if you're in New York, where this is from. The new ad for the Delacroix exhibition. It's, you can't miss that it's from Mia. I um, want to be really um, clear that we rolled this out internally first, and so none of our staff or stakeholders were surprised by the process, felt like they weren't in line with it, and um, that made them great advocates. So when we rolled it out, they were the first people saying, this is what we always have thought the museum is, this is what we've said it is, now we're just demonstrating it with a graphic that reflects that. We um, rolled it out with staff t-shirts, which seems minor, except that the staff wear the t-shirts all the time. Every Friday is staff t-shirts. So again, rolling it out internally with really public-facing things. We did a brand campaign. I hope that it's creatively connected. No, I'm just kidding. I know it is, right? Because we want it to be creative, the creativity to, to connect across platforms. And I think we've done a successful job doing that here. Um, again, with the campaign, billboards. Um, a, a website that's built responsively, so Douglas's team scrubbed the website in two weeks, um, again, connected to the other medium. Um, signage all over the place. And then we rolled it out with a big block party um, on August 9th where we celebrated with our visitors. So we had a plan, we had the process, and we had success in the fact that, as Kaylin mentioned, our attendance has grown 70% in the last few years, culminating in two, two, 2015 with 850,000 museum visits. That's record-breaking, um, not just for our museum, but for lots of museums. So Douglas, what do we do with 850,000 visits? That's a good question, <laughs> Kaylin. Do you have an app now? <laughs> right, so what's going to happen next? And I'm completely, entirely aware that I'm between you and lunch, so I'm going to move pretty fast. And we can talk about this over lunch if you have questions. The answer is science, <laughs> right? So this presentation today was supposed to be about science. What are we going to do with these 850,000 pairs of feet that came through the museum? Who are they? What, what are they up to? What are we going to do? We've heard mention of CRM. Museums don't have CRM. We just finished a complete implementation of Salesforce. So all of our constituent data is now in Salesforce. This is revolutionary in the museum world, which may be a little bit of a surprise to you, but we're beginning to understand who the people are. So that will hopefully give us this sort of virtual cycle of data, right? And I'm sure you're all familiar with this. The more we communicate, the more we know who you are if you opt in, the more we give you some kind of personalization, you'll participate and we feed data, but that's not the goal. The goal isn't data. The goal is loyalty, ultimately. We're a regional museum. This metropolitan statistical area is about three million people. We would love all of them to come, maybe not on the same day, but over the course of the year, we'd love everybody to come. It is the People's Museum. But even the loyalty isn't the only goal. Loyalty leads people to be champions for the institution, to participate more frequently so that we can learn more about them, and ultimately, hopefully, to give money. One of the things we need to target in our entire sector is more microfunding. More people giving small amounts of money the same way that a Bernie Sanders campaign or Obama campaign made funding in the past. That's a target that we have. Now, we have a problem. Um, you don't have to buy a ticket. You don't have to say hi. You can breeze right in. It's free, and we are completely committed to staying free. It's your museum. Come, walk in, enjoy the place. It's fantastic. It's a world-class collection. Did I mention it's free? For goodness sake, most people don't even understand what this means. But what it means is those 850,000 pairs of feet, we only know about maybe 20% of those people who happen to be members who happen to buy a ticket at a discount that day. Who on earth those other 600,000-ish people are is a problem for us. We have a lot of unknown. So we have to make assumptions. and We have to sort of dream up what we're going to do. And we need to move from this old model of bias and historical precedent to data and data-driven decision making. Because people are willing, as you know, to give up personal information if they find value in doing so. As a trusted nonprofit organization, we theorize that people might even be more willing to give us information. We're not talking about credit card numbers and personally identifiable information. We're talking about preferences and interests, um, personal activities and behaviors and what that might mean. 
So we've already been making fun of segments and groups, which so I don't have to go into this in too much detail. But it's the same thing. Yes, we can make up personas until the cows come home. We can make assumptions. And we can send out targeted messaging to certain groups. And we get some response if that's fine. But it's not personalization. Those groups are not built on actually analyzing who the individuals are before we put them into groups. They're based on assumptions. So a couple of things we're going to do, and I hope all of you will pay attention to this. We're going to launch a rewards program. Now, I've thrown it up here as a sort of card. Actually, it'll be mobile enabled, and we'll have a number of other methods for getting in. The idea is the more you participate with us, whether you show up and transact, maybe you talk about us on social media, maybe you recommend your friends to come, um, buy tickets, become a member. We have a free membership level, so you're free, free, free. But you can raise your hand and be a part of what's going on. Once you opt in, we can recognize all those activities and behaviors, give you some points. Those points would accrue, and then you would cash them in, more or less, for unique, individual, behind the scenes, and special kinds of experiences. We don't want to be giving away bags of stuff because that can hurt the bottom line. We can do things sort of inside the normal budget that people will find very, very special. Every single person in Salesforce will have their own personal page through our website. No other museum in North America does this. You can't update your address at the Metropolitan Museum. You have to send a letter <laughs> or call a customer service room. Right? <sighs> we were in the same boat. We're almost there. This has been sort of pre-designed, and we're ready to launch it soon. It will be miraculous to museum patrons, right? They can actually go in and express their preferences and change their own email address or telephone number. So this graphic, and it's a little dense, but the idea is that bottom half is where we went with that DNA strategic plan. We drove awareness, as Kristen was talking about. I don't think we've ever had such high awareness across the MSA. We definitely drove attraction, and we did it without a blockbuster exhibition. We didn't have. Princess dies outfits. We didn't have a huge Monet or Picasso. We didn't have cats and angels in art, right? Instead, we had great programming week after week after week and surprising and cool things. So we have this moment in time where we can move into the upper categories of attachment and allegiance. And I encourage you, you can't read this, but uh, Funk and James wrote this really interesting paper. It comes out of sports psychology. There's psychology again. It's called the psychological construct model. And the idea is you respect your customers at any of these levels. Duh, right? But museums have sort of always really been looking for only really providing great content for aficionados. We want content across the spectrum for everybody. When we accomplish this, we'll actually deliver on the promise of our brand. And every one of you and everyone here will honestly feel me as mine. Thank you. reconvene at 2 o'clock, because one of the things we learned is that having plenty of time to get to know each other and uh, have those kind of informal conversations about what you heard this morning, talk to some of the speakers, uh, will be really great. John, thank you so much for hosting. Dawn from 3M is going to uh, help kick us off this afternoon. Chris Bacon, thanks for all your hard work putting the whole program together. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, head off to lunch, and we'll see you back at 2 o'clock.